Test one, there we go, good job. Speaker in that video, uh, gentleman Francis Chan, if you did not know who that was, and he's, he's a gentleman, we've, we've been using the, the book Letters to the Church for a sermon series prior to the one we've been working on now, and he was the author of that book, and um, it's a message he gave, I believe, earlier in the week, if not last week, to a university, he mentioned he'd been there 20 years, I'm actually glad you got to see that first part, because it gave the second part some context. He'd been teaching there for 20 years, um, and that was his context of saying things are different on the university in uh, APU, Azusa Pacific, um, it's an evangelical Christian campus, and so anyway, that was his observation, and, and for all of us, as we have been talking about uh, 2020 being the global year of the Bible, and how we want to emphasize that within ourselves, um, that was just a good, uh, a good illustration for us to, um, to look at now. Not that we will wait till 2020 to, to reinvest ourselves into Scripture, um, but we want to make sure that when we get there, we can invest that whole year as an offering to the Lord um, with, with reverence and commitment to, to being in His Word. Um, this morning, we're going to look at a, a message, uh, basically, Be Reconciled. We've been doing the sermon series, Lord, What Would You Have Me To Do? And we've talked about a, a few things in, in the week's past. Uh, just for example, I'll go all the way to the first week that I preached um, and we use the expression, come, stay, go, which, if you recall, there were three different um, illustrations from Scripture we referenced, where in one illustration, uh, Jesus was calling his disciples to come, to follow him, and to literally walk with him for three years and to, to be by his side. Uh, we, we mentioned and referenced the demon-possessed man who uh, Jesus had healed from his demon possession, and he really wanted to come and follow Jesus just like the other disciples were. He was very enthusiastic about wanting to do that, but Jesus said, no, I need you to stay here. And then we talked about the rich young ruler who um, thought he was following the Lord, but then when confronted with that one thing that he uh, found to be more important than God, he went away very sad because he was very rich. And so the come, stay, go. And so um, there are some things we've talked about as, as it relates to, Lord, what would you have me to do, that we have to be more personalized in how we interpret that, because uh, some of us may be come, some of us may be stay, some of us may be go, for example, and so it's not a universal um, uh, dictate for us to follow those things. But this morning, we are talking about something that does have universal application. There is not a single believer or Christian amongst us that is uh, uh, relinquished from the, the necessity and the obligation the challenge of um, making reconciliation. And so uh, I hope you'll uh, interpret it that way as well this morning. I want to start with a, an illustration from uh, a book I've been reading, uh, Jim and Sharon uh, Van Puren. They are now are uh, ministry consultants where they go and do consultation for different churches. Um, but for a season, he was an interim pastor. And I just want to read an illustration from, from his book I, I've been reading recently to kind of set our foundation for our time this morning. Um, he says, years ago, while I was serving as an intentional interim pastor, I had learned that Sa Susan, who was a church member, believed that I hated her. Now, when I asked her about this, she said, Pastor, three weeks ago, I drove by the church parking lot, and I waved to you. You looked right at me and then turned your back, and I knew that you didn't like me. And so then he elaborates, many church conflicts start with issues no bigger than this. So he says, and he goes into some confession, he says, my first thought was selfish. I don't have time for this. But then I caught myself, he says, and I asked, Susan, I honestly don't recall not waving to you. When, when did this happen? And so Susan mentions the date when she was certain I had snubbed her, which has happened to be a day when I was on another, in another church halfway across the country. It could not have possibly been me, and Susan had me confused with someone else. And so here, everything depended on, upon what I said next. I could have easily said, look, Susan, I've got more important things to deal with than your petty concerns about people waving to you. Or he could have said, uh, he could have told Susan that she's a loony or a paranoid uh, pain in the neck. He, uh, he says, I could have just tried to assuage her with an, of course I care about you, and just moved on and not really dealt with this specific situation. He says, I could have just been very factual and said, I was out of town, so, and then left it. And that would have absolved him and resolved the situation to some degree, but, excuse me, but not resolved the situation. He says, or I could see that Susan was hurt and that the problem was deeper. And again, he confesses that earlier in my life, I would have responded very defensively, but God led me to say this instead. Susan, I'm sure I was out of town that week, 
And so that, that wasn't me, but there's got to be something more. I must be doing something that causes you to think that I hate you, and that concerns me. Can we talk about it? And so he interpreted that specific situation as being part of a larger issue of concern that Susan had. It wasn't just that he was, she felt snubbed. It was she felt snubbed on top of, on top of, on top of, on top of, and then she interprets that as him hating her. And that concerns me, he said. Can we talk about it? And Susan and I sat down to talk. And he says, I learned that I had been insensitive and unkind to Susan and to others. So that wasn't a situation where he was at fault, but he learned there were other things that he was doing. And by my opening up to hear the truth, Susan showed me areas of my life that God wanted me to change. By being defensive, even when you're right, you miss the opportunity to learn and be reconciled. And so today we're going to take a look at a few scripture verses, um, and we're going to move them through them very, fairly quickly. Normally, I, I'm not a big fan of putting scriptures on the screen because I want us to be able to sword drill and look through scripture, but um, for the sake of efficiency this morning, we're going to have them on the screen. And there's going to be a couple of scriptures that you're going to look at um, within those, those larger texts that are going to be familiar to you. Um, but the challenge is those familiarity, familiar verses aren't going to be probably what you're familiar with um, in and of themselves, because we usually take them out of context. We've talked about this with a couple of other scripture verses in the recent past. Um, Lord, I know um, the plans you have for me, not to hurt me, but to prosper, those things that can be taken out of context. Uh, um, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not about being a champion sports athlete. It's about actually suffering for Christ, but we can take those out of context, and they become bumper stickers or, or face, mark, uh, face paint or tattoos, and that's not really what um, God intends them for, to, for them to be. And so as we look at a couple of these verses, you're going to have some of those, and I'll try to, to highlight them, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll have some corrective understanding of what those scriptures really um, mean and reference. And so the first one is um, James chapter 4. So it says, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? I need to we need to highlight that there. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward, toward God? So that very clearly tells us his audience. His audience is not the world that you would expect to have these types of behaviors. The audience that James is speaking to is the church. It's the church that causes wars and fights. It's the church that's causing, um, uh, that, that he's claiming is murderous and covetous. It's the church that he's saying is adulterous. Now, I don't think they would have thought that of themselves, but when confronted with it, they needed to reflect and think, is that possible? Is that true? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Or do you think it's without reason that the scripture says, he jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We all know that one, right? Probably not in this context, though. Resist the devil, not because it, we're, we're, we're right and we're perfect and it's just the devil trying to rain on our parade. Resist the devil because the devil is really trying his best to make us do those things that we just talked about. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Don't criticize one another, brothers and sisters. Anyone who defames or judges a fellow believer defames and judges the law. If you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And there is, an, there is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, this is very important. Um, this is one of those things where uh, uh, it's the expression of proof texting, where basically you take a, a, a piece of scripture here, a short one here, and a short one here, and a short one here, and most of the time it's used in a negative way to just defend your uh, predisposed position. I want to believe this, similar to what Francis Chan was saying. I want to believe this, 
And quite honestly, the Bible gives us the opportunity to believe whatever we want and for it to back that up if we are so particular about how we select Scripture. Um, and so we can do that by proof texting. I want to believe A, and so I'm going to take this Scripture and this Scripture and this Scripture, and this is the evidence for me to get to continue believing what I want to believe. And this is one of those Scriptures as well, do not judge. And we, and we know um, Jesus talks about um, do not judging. First take the plank out of your own eye. So there's a caveat to it, and we're going to talk about that before. Um, this is not a hard exclamation point, do not judge, that's it. There's context behind this. And so we're not proof texting, but we are referencing because there's other um, scriptures that help us fill out what um, is more fully meant. Because when James is speaking to a body of believers, he's speaking to them knowing that they have this other information from other scriptures as well, so he's not bringing out the full um, explanation at this particular point. But here we have James telling us not to um, criticize one another's brothers and sisters. Now very quickly, um, to kind of set a a fuller explanation on what um, reconciling means or an example of, of reconciliation or the command for it. Matthew 5, if you want to look at it now or you look at it later, Matthew 5, 23 through 24, I'll read it very quickly. He says, So if you are offering your gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go first and be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. So we're going to talk about, the um, in a few minutes, we're going to talk about how we need to confront somebody if we believe that they have sinned against us. But we also need to recognize that we are responsible if somebody has an issue with us. If they've instigated the issue and are not confronting us, but we know that they have a concern about us, a, 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 they have a problem with us, if you will, Scripture says we're responsible for engaging that dialogue, that communication. From the message, the, the illustration I just used, Jim Van Puren, he says, when I asked her about this, she didn't say, Pastor, can, can, can I schedule a meeting with you. I need to talk about something. He heard that she had this opinion about him, that he hated her. He had to go and talk to her about it. Now, he could have said, you know what? That's her problem. If she wants to talk to me about it, I'm right here. She knows where to find me. But that's not what Scripture tells us to do. Scripture says, if you are coming to church... You're coming to worship on this side or on this side. If you're coming to church and you want to present an offering to me and you want to come and worship me, but you know that somebody has a concern towards you, you may not be at fault, but somebody has a concern towards you. So far as it depends on you, we'll talk a little bit about this in a minute too. So far as it depends on you, you need to make peace. Leave your offering go try to reconcile with that person. In a very little literal sense, there, presumably there, there would be a day in which you show up in the morning and I'm scheduled to preach and I'm not here because I realize somebody's got an issue with me that I need to go reconcile first because I can't speak the word of the Lord to you and tell you to love your neighbor as your brother if I know that this person has an issue and I'm avoiding that interaction. So that's the significance, that's uh, uh, not severity, but that's the significance of reconciliation, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So all that to say is reconciliation, whether you're the instigator or whether the instigator is somebody else, reconciliation starts with you and I. Let me go back to James real fast. You desire, James chapter 4, I'll put it back on the screen. It says you murder and you covet and you cannot obtain. Once again, remember, he's talking to the church. And it's not that the church is going around in those days with the knife ending people's lives. But he still calls them murderers. And why does he call them murderers? Because God, Jesus, has a different definition of murder than what you and I would constitute murder. 
we justify our, some of our actions by saying, well, it's not that bad. And what did Jesus say? You've heard that you should not murder, but I tell you, if you're angry or if you insult a brother or sister, that's just as, that's the same to me. That's just as doing murder to them. And so James is reinforcing that. James, Jesus' brother, is reinforcing that thought. And so when we look at Francis Chan in the very visible illustration he used on the screen, we take the word of the Lord and we say, well, it doesn't quite mean that. So this doesn't apply to me anymore. I'm not murdering anybody. And Jesus says, well, what's my definition of murder? And then we have to be honest with ourselves. Am I murdering? And then we have to ask ourselves, do we even care? Does it matter that I'm doing that? Do I care? Reconciliation. Let's move on to Galatians. So we're kind of working uh, backwards towards Jesus. So we start with James, which is more towards the back of the Bible. We're moving um, more to the left, if you're in your, in your Bible, and we're going to Galatians 6, 1 and 2, just two verses here. It says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with gentle spirit, watching out for yourself so that you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens in this way, and you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, we have a bit of a contradiction here. James says, don't, don't judge. Even Jesus says, don't judge. But here Paul is saying, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, well, to identify that somebody's in wrongdoing, I have to judge or, or at least consider or apply the fact that they're doing something wrong. I have to be, in an essence, judging their behavior. Those of you who are spiritual. Those of you who have sought out the word of the Lord and are true to your discipleship of him. Those of you that have re recognized you had a plank in your own eye, but you've removed it, and now you're able to see clearly, you do have not just the opportunity, but you have the responsibility of trying to invest and engage somebody who is on the way wrong, wayward path. Someone that is leaving the fellowship of our Lord. If someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person. Now, this is interesting, too, because uh, in, in the scripture we're going to talk about in a second, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, well, this doesn't even say you have to have that type of relationship. It just says, if you observe anybody within your fellowship that has wrongdoing, then you have the responsibility to go and engage them. Hey, I see you're not doing so well. You haven't been at church for a while been looking at some of your Facebook posts. I'm a little concerned about your spiritual health. How are you doing spiritually? You and I have that obligation to one another to love each other that much that we will engage each other that way. That we would not stray and wander. And we'll fast forward to Matthew now. Matthew chapter 18. Now, these are in red letters on the screen because if you have a Bible that has Jesus' words in red letters, they will be in red letters. And I want to emphasize that because, um, again, we're in a very uh, too smart for ourselves um, culture where we know better than uh, the generations of, of Christianity before us. And uh, we might dismiss, well, that's James and he's got a specific context, or that's Paul and he's got, a, he's got a specific situation that he's dealing with, so we don't have to consider what they're saying, even though they're reinforcing the same thing. But you can't take Jesus' words and misconstrue them. At some point, you at least have to say, well, I may not like what James said, and I have the tendency to dismiss James because it's James, and I may not like what Paul said because I have the tendency to dismiss Paul because it's Paul, but if I deny Jesus, then I deny God. And so if this is what Jesus says, then maybe we need to take a little bit more emphasis, put a little more emphasis back on what Paul and James said. But here, um, Jesus is speaking. If your brother sins against you. Now, the other thing I just want to highlight, sins against you. So we might say, well, if it's only dealing with me, then that's the only thing I have to deal with, even though Paul said something different. Well, the reality is those two words, against you, aren't part of the original manuscripts. Now, we add in because there's a lot of, of manuscripts that have them, but the earliest manuscripts just says, just say, if your brother sins, go and rebuke him in private. So it doesn't have to have that personal relationship. It's just your brother as a... Uh, uh, um, 
as a, as a believer, fellow believer. If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. Now that word rebuke in this translation is a little bit harsh because you're not going and you're not pointing your finger at them. You actually need to be a little bit more loving and sensitive and affirming. Not condemning in the way that you approach them because if you're spiritually mature, you would speak to them in love. But to go to them in private, and if he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. And if he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. And if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and tax collector to you. And truly, I tell you, here's one we know. Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two, not toe, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. We like that one, right? And we use it as a wish list. Well, let's come together and let's pray for what we want for the Lord. Because the scripture says two or three gathered. But he wants us to gather in two or three, not for our Christmas list, but so that those who are wayward, that we would engage them in love and bring them back into the fold. That's why two and three gather together. So that the church can be restored and reconciled. I want to... Um, probably a silly illustration. So I, I use this whiteboard just every now and then, uh, just a, a couple times. But I remember the first time I used it, and I brought it in here, and, and I had it um, parallel to this wall, because I didn't want it to be an obstruction on the platform. And that, that's where I set it up. And then I came out later, and I saw that it was moved one way. And I was like, why did somebody move my, my whiteboard? And then, later on, I didn't confront anybody, because I didn't know who to confront. Um, but I noticed it was moved, but it perturbed me. Why did somebody move my, move my whiteboard? And then I realized that it was probably Chuck because he had to get no, because he had to get to his board so that the band knew what numbers to play, and the whiteboard was in his way from doing that. And I believe I went to Chuck and just humorously said, "Yeah, I, I, sorry, I had the whiteboard there. If I didn't, I'm doing it now publicly." Um, and and said, "You know, I'm sorry, I had the whiteboard there. I didn't realize it was." Uh, in the way, um, but to go to, use, use the illustration earlier about someone feeling snubbed, I don't know, a, a personality, maybe you can think of somebody, um, a, a personality, an officer that comes and does something and has something changed from the way they do it, and maybe you've had experience where they just come and they're all bullish, who did this, how in the world could you do this? without understanding that there's a pre perfectly practical explanation on why it happened? How much church conflict can be resolved if we just forgive and love and entertain one another and just understand that we all have perspectives? And so we're going to talk a little bit real quick about this idea of um, triangulation. So I'm going to put you on this side. And I'm going to put me over here. And I'm, I'm going to make me the uh, the egregious one. So if you perceive that I do something sinful, I want to highlight sinful, not, uh, not out of preferences. Those are different conversations, but we're going to stick with sinful for now. If you recognize or perceive that I do something sinful, what should be the way that we engage? Well, we should use Scripture, right? And we should especially use Scripture because most of us do not like conflict. Overwhelmingly, most of us do not like conflict. And then those of us that do, there's a large portion of those that only like it because of the chaos that it, that it presents. I am not somebody who likes conflict. I, I do not like it. It keeps me up at night. But in the end, God calls me to engage and to represent him, and that, that requires me to engage in, in some circumstances. And so if, if I sin against you or perceive to sin against you, that's important, what's the responsibility? Well, ideally, you come back to me in a gracious manner and almost in an apologetic manner, ideally, because it's, I think you did this, and I don't know that you recognize that this is the result of what happened. So it's a very forgiving expression, even. 
And then I had the opportunity to say, you know what? Now that you mention it, that um, I, I understand what you're saying. I need, I need to do something about that. I, I apologize. I'm sorry. Or even if it was sinful, whether it was um, accidental or intentional, then it gives me the opportunity to, to repent and to, 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 to change. And if so, then that's good. Or it's a matter of, Chuck, why did you move the whiteboard? We need to have a, send a, an email in all caps. Chuck, don't move the whiteboard. See me tomorrow night in my office. Okay? And then Chuck tells me that he moves the whiteboard because why in the world would I put it in front of his numbers board? And then we get into this conflict about who's the bigger man, not in the, not in the appropriate way, but in the, the comp- competitive way. But in the end, it's a matter of, you know, there's an understanding, there's a, there's a, there's a reason why we both miscommunicated, if you will, or, or, or again, more so for me. And if that's the case, then everything's good. If the sin comes and we confront one another with love, even rebuke, again, we'll use scripture word because that's the translation, but knowing that it probably means something more harsh to us than what scripture intends. But then things are okay. We're restored. We've reconciled. And again, most of the time we've reconciled over something that doesn't even need to be reconciled. It just needs to be understood or explained. But too often, this is where we fall into the culture trap, where we, where we affirm culture by the way that we respond to things that should be done in the church, the way things should be done in the church. And this person goes and they talk to their family or they talk to their friends or they talk to Facebook. Can you believe what this person did to me? Can you believe how this person treated me? Can you believe this interaction that we had? And all they're doing is getting affirmed for their own um, um, self-righteous attitudes. Family's not necessarily going to confront them. Friends, you know, it's our job to make each other feel better, to lift each other up. We're not necessarily going to say, hold on a second, unless we're very mature in the faith. Facebook certainly is not going to say, hold on a second. Did you look at all perspectives there? Did you actually, Facebook's not going to come back and said, you know, you really should confront that person straight on. And I think it's, it's ironic, if not appropriate, that these are all Fs. Because that's the grade we get if this is the way we approach conflict. We take something that's probably, more times than not, just a misunderstanding and actually become sinful ourselves by the way that we react with other people about it. And so instead, what we should do, you come to me, and I say, get out of here. Get out of here, you're crazy. Stop being so sensitive. But it's a significant issue that shouldn't be dropped, that shouldn't be stopped. So then you go, to one or two people who are what? Spiritually mature, as Scripture reminded us. And not necessarily our friends. Because in some case, we have to, again, accept an apologetic expression and say, you know what? I think Captain David did this thing. I, I, I asked him about it, and he just dismissed me, but I think it's significant. I think it's sinful, and, and, and I think we need to talk to him a little bit more deeply about it. And this person will do one of two things. If you get the right people, they will affirm you and say, you know what, you're absolutely right. That's, that's exactly what we need to do. Let's you and I and, and this person, let's set up a time to meet with him because it, it does need to be addressed. Or in some cases, again, this goes back to the misunderstanding uh, p- potential, is this person may say, maybe they have a little bit more information. And again, it depends on how I would respond if we're using myself in the illustration. This person may say, um, you know, there's more to that story. Your, your concern, as far as you know, is actually very sincere and not wrong, but you only know part of what's going on. Now, this person shouldn't dismiss my behavior and say, well, that's just Captain David being Captain David or just, just him blowing off steam. That's not appropriate. But if we're talking about a larger issue that you would pick up on, for example, this person may say, you're absolutely right from what you know you are right to be concerned, but that's not actually the issue that's going on. I can't tell you any more than that, but I need you to know that that's not, tr- that's not true. So, but again, we go to the point where what, what the concern is is correct, then the three of them go here, and 
Hopefully, I would see the severity of it by not just having the one person come, but then the three people come and say, you know what? We've seen this as more than just a single episode. It's, it's a pattern that we're witnessing, that we're recognizing, similar to how Jim admitted, confessed, how he had seen how he was actually hurting other people. That's the way we should do it. If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you won't have your brother. You have won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two others so that the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. Every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention to, even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and tax collector. Quick concept. We're getting close. Um, Reconciliation, the responsibility and the purpose of reconciliation is to restore fellowship, not leadership. What I mean by that is individual personalities are not the reason in which we reconcile. So, for example, again, if you see, I'll use, keep using Facebook because I'm not on Facebook, so I don't see what you post. I don't post anything. Um, but if I were on Facebook and I posted myself at a casino pulling a lever or drinking a beer, and one of you rightly comes up and confronts me and says, what's, what's this about? Well, that's, that's just how I have to spend my time. I just, I just need it. It's, it's, I've got all this other stuff going on. It's just the way I need to do it. Well, to restore a leader, you would say, okay, all right. As long as you keep it kind of like, you can do it. I know you're doing it, but just don't put it on Facebook anymore so that other people don't know that you're doing it. I know it's not, you're not supposed to do it as a salvationist, as an officer, but we really need you as the core officer. We really need you as a leader. So we're going we're gonna to concede these things that you do so that we can keep you over here. That would be restoring the leader, which would be wrong. The responsibility is not to restore leadership, but fellowship. You are more important than an individual if the individual decides that they prefer not to be in fellowship. If they decide that um, they don't want to concede to, um, to the will of God and what it means to be a believer to him, then if they make that decision, they need to be allowed to go their way, hopefully for the sake of restoration. We would never, we should never celebrate. Maybe it's happened here and maybe there's some confession that needs to be made, not necessarily allowed in public, but if we've ever celebrated somebody leaving this congregation, this core, then we have sinned. It should hurt us when somebody leaves. Whether that's an officer that's overstayed their welcome or whether it's a soldier that um, we were glad to see their rear end as they left. We are wrong if in our hearts we are glad that that happens because it's about reconciliation and bringing people uh, under the umbrella of God. Because presumably... If there's a problem, then that problem is going to continue and it's never going to get resolved and therefore the church is never made whole. We're not the church. We're part of the church. And so we're responsible to each other to hold each other accountable. I really like in another book I'm reading um, very quickly here, um, there's an expression of uh, Michelangelo. And um, the author says, uh, if somebody sees, uh, a, 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 I'm going to use a, a block of marble, for example, an inventor looks at that and says, what can I create? What can I make out of that? Almost what can I impose on that? Michelangelo, when he saw a block of marble, he says, what's in there that I need to help get out? What's in there that I need to help get out? Not to create it in my own design, but what's in there that I need to get, get out? And oftentimes he had very scriptural uh, referenced um, expressions. And so... In a very similar way, we should look at each other, not as projects or burdens, but what's in each of us that we can help each other get out that God wants to reveal, that we can all, um, in our individual selves, be all that God wants us to be and then restored and reconciled. I just want to end on a chorus, and then I'm going to use... Um, 2 Corinthians as a benediction for us this morning. Chorus is uh, 
It's not going to be on the screen. Don't worry about that, Bill. Um, I think enough of us know it. Love, 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 love. The gospel in a word is love. Love your neighbor as your brother. Love, love, love. Can we try saying that together? Love, 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 love. The gospel in a word is love. Love your neighbor as your brother. Love, love, love. One more time. Love, 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 love. The gospel in a word is love. Love your neighbor as your brother. Love, love, love. I just want to add one more point um, that I don't want to forget before I read our benediction. Um, I think it's I think it's fair and true and accurate to say you have to earn someone's respect. I believe that's that's fair and accurate. But you cannot earn love. You cannot require somebody to earn your love. And in fact, I believe this phrase, unconditional love, is a redundancy. You don't need unconditional. You either love or you don't love. If you love on prerequisite, then that's, that's manipulation. That's not love. And so it, you don't need unconditional in front of it. You either love or you don't love. And God does not withhold his love from us if we don't love other people. That's not the way it works. There's some nuance here. He doesn't withhold it if we're not loving other people. The reality is, if we're not loving other people, it's because God's love is not within us. Because if we had God's love, then out of, of an overflow, we would already be loving people. It would be automatic. And so it's not a conscious effort of, can I love this person? Should I love this person? How hard do I have to work to love this, this person? Now, there is work involved in relationships, no doubt. But when it comes to love and seeing somebody made in the image of God, when it comes to seeing somebody as a, as a marble mold and saying, what can I help get out of this person for God's sake in their relationship with God? Love is not something that God withholds from us if we don't love other people. But God's love in us is evidenced by whether or not we are loving other people because it's an outflow of the love that we have within us. So let me close with this benediction for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. And I'm going to read it as a prayer. So Lord God, from now on, we do not uh, know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we had known your son Jesus Christ, our Savior, from a worldly perspective, yet we now no longer know him in that way. Therefore, if anyone, all of us, we are in Christ, we are new creations. The old has passed away and the new has come. Everything is from you, God, you who reconciled us to yourself through Christ, and you've given us the ministry of reconciliation which is Jesus Christ. And through him, God, you were reconciling the world to you. You weren't counting our trespasses against us, and you have committed to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we get to be your ambassadors, since you are making this appeal through us. So we plead on Christ's behalf, our Savior's behalf, let us be reconciled to you, God. You made the one who did not know sin to be sin in our place so that in him, our Savior, we might become your righteousness, Lord. Heavenly Father, um, help us to um, love you enough uh, to do things that are not very comfortable for us in your will, Lord. Help us to love our brothers and sisters enough to, um, at times, let them uh, get, at, get it out. Let them just, uh, let us be the, the mat that they need to, to stomp on. But at other times, it's very necessary for us to confront and to engage them, each other, in behavior that is unbecoming of your children, Lord. Help us to know um, those differences. Help us to be spiritually sound ourselves, that we would be um, uh, found with sound doctrine in our lives, and then that we would be um, uh, sensitive to see the need to engage others and be found um, respectful enough because of our faith, because of our true faith, to help bring others to know you as well, Lord. Thank you for this body of believers, for this part of your church that gathers regularly to worship.